Patrick Harvey, COP26 is coming up. What's your big sell on the climate at this election? Well, very clearly, this is an election where our future really depends on the decisions that are going to be made, not just across the river from this studio at the, the climate conference, but in the Scottish Parliament as well. Scotland has set its climate targets and then repeatedly missed them. The current Scottish Government really does need to take responsibility for the fact that in areas like transport, emissions are going up. They're going in the wrong direction. It's not just that progress is too slow, we're going the wrong direction. So we need to take that bold, transformative approach we need to say that a just transition begins right now instead of thinking oil and gas extraction lasts for another generation. We need to be investing in public transport that will meet the needs of every community across Scotland uh, and do that affordably. By doing these things, we can have the economic recovery from the pandemic as well that will generate the jobs of the future. So if we believe in that kind of optimistic vision of Scotland's future, we need to vote like our future depends on it. Now, depending on, on what voters decide on May the 6th, and it's entirely up to them, would you consider going into a coalition after the, the election? Well, I mean, I've, I've seen various uh, you know, folk in the media speculating about this. We, we don't speculate about this. We're focusing on winning people's trust, inspiring people with a, a positive vision about Scotland's future. Well, Greens, I, I heard you say this week that you aspire to, to be a party of government at Greens, some point. Why not now? Greens in a, a wide range of countries, including many other European countries, have been in government. And I, I absolutely hold that aspiration uh, for my party. Very clearly, we're, we've got six seats at the last election. Some of the polls are suggesting that we could double that uh, at the, this election. And that would be a good, strong group so of Green MSPs. That, would you consider going into government? Well... You know, we, we would look at the, the arithmetic in the next parliament. And if the, if the leading party that has to form the next government wants to speak to us, I suspect most of our party would be willing to talk. There are really big differences, though, between ourselves and the SNP on a number of issues like oil and gas, like public transport, well, like the nature I mean, you, of the you, economy. You, you, I mean, you've been accused of being the little helpers in the last parliament. <laughs> Five budgets and you, two confidence votes you backed them on. You've been reading too many Tory leaflets, <laughs> honestly. You know, the, there is a there's a narrative that some on the right of politics like to create around that. In reality, actually, uh, the Tories have voted with the SNP on a number of issues. But on the key it votes, was, you voted with them in was, terms of the budgets and in terms of the confidence votes. It was green pressure that got the, the government, to the SNP, to stop working with the Tories to bail out the landlords and start bailing out tenants in the private rented sector, protecting them from eviction. Because you bailed out the SNP? Because we put pressure on the SNP. We always do that by putting positive, constructive ideas on the table. I wish other opposition parties well, would do the same. Could you do that in government then? And if you did, what would be your red lines for those negotiations? I think very clearly there are really substantial differences that we would have to, to talk to uh, any other party about. We've shown in the last five years... So what are your red lines? What's non-negotiable for the Greens? We've shown in the last five years that bringing constructive pressure to bear from opposition can get results. I'm really proud of that track record and I would have no worries about continuing to, to make an impact, make a difference for the people of Scotland in that way in the next session, whatever the, the parliamentary arithmetic was. So you, but don't if, think, but you, the, you don't think you'll be in government? Then. If the party that's biggest, that forms the next government, wants to talk to us, I suspect most of our party would be very comfortable having that conversation. But it would be a tough conversation in terms of things like wealth taxes, in terms of things like investing in public transport instead of a multi-billion pound road building programme that's going to make our climate crisis worse, not better. Well, let's, SNP, come on to that. Let's, Let, remember... let's, let's come on to that in terms of transport. One of your big issues there is rail transport. You're talking about £22 billion pounds of investment. Where's that money coming from? Over a Is that scrapping all the roads investment? Over a 20-year programme. It would involve redirecting from uh, road building, which makes not just climate emissions, but also congestion and pollution worse, not better. So it would involve redirecting. But there's also a recognition across all the redirecting parties. Redirecting all of it? it there's also a re recognition across all the parties that the COVID recovery, the recovery from this pandemic, needs to be investment-led. It can't be left to the market. It needs the role of the state, including with borrowing powers, to invest in the priorities of the future. And if we're willing to do that, we'll not only 
reduce our emissions, not only have an economic recovery, but will create the kind of sustainable prosperity that will last for the 21st century. But isn't duelling the A77 in the southwest of Scotland to the ports, isn't duelling that can completing the duelling of the A9, aren't they crucial services for the people of Scotland? There are certainly areas in our road network that need maintenance and that need safety improvements. But building ever more capacity in the road network is a self-defeating policy. It generates ever more traffic, which generates more pollution, more ill health, and it actually doesn't help the economy in the long run. It leaves people spending more of their money to spend more of their time stuck in traffic jams. If you want to build a rail tunnel under the fourth, I haven't heard anybody saying that's something that's necessary at all. Only the Greens. Well, that's one element of, a, of as I said, a 20-year programme. And each element of the... It's a big if we were, six billion pounds. If we, were, if we were in the position of being able to deliver that whole programme, each element of it would be subject to scrutiny. But the scrutiny of transport policies in Scotland at the moment simply doesn't add up. We're but it sounds approving. like a vanity project. If no one else is demanding it, I'm not hearing anybody from the rail network demanding it. Everybody likes the bridge, let's face it, across the fourth. Everybody likes going across the fourth rail bridge. Why do you need a tunnel? Well, the, the, the Rail for All report that you're talking about was worked up with rail industry experts. So that's not just our ideas. David it's the Stephen ideas of to be one of your party people. members. It's the ideas of people who've been experts in the rail industry for many, many years. But look, if Scotland aspires to what many of, of our European neighbours have, a world-class public transport system that's affordable, that's run in the public sector and in the public interest, and that serves every part of our Scotland, we need to be bold about it. And what about the, the North Sea oil and gas industry? You want to close it down when? Very clearly, what we should be starting with is no new exploration licences because we you have actually want to close three down, times you? more fossil fuels than we can afford to use. But you actually want to close it down, don't Revoke you? Revoke the undeveloped licences and with the existing operational fields, set a timescale for winding them down. So but why the, is your timescale? Well, it's, it would be up to, to assessing each individual operational field. Right at the What's moment, we're saying, we're saying no new exploration licences and revoke the undeveloped ones. But what's your target the, for closing them down? The... The critical, Within the next parliament? The critical target is uh, our climate change envelope, the, the window of opportunity we have. We have three times more fossil fuels in existing reserves than we can afford to use. So the transition away from fossil fuels needs to be on that timescale. It needs to be making sure that we're no longer using fossil fuels by the time we reach that maximum envelope. You say nine years is and your target for turning things around. Is that your target think, for closing down the North Sea? I think that would it would be realistic to develop the alternative industries that the communities that are currently dependent on a dying industry fossil fuels, they're going to need those alternative yeah. industries. We can invest in that. Let's not leave it to chance. Let's not leave it to the market. That failed Scotland okay. in previous waves of deindustrialisation. When you see economic change coming, you have to plan for it. You have to invest in what's going to be needed for the future. Something else you have to plan for if you're in the Green Party certainly is another independence referendum. What would be a mandate for that in the next parliament, do you think? Oh, very clearly, a simple majority of the votes in the in the next Scottish Parliament. If the people of Scotland choose to elect a pro-independence majority in the next Scottish Parliament, then that's a, a mandate for that Parliament but that's to decide. That's what in the last Parliament, and it hasn't delivered, has it? Well, we believe that the the continued opposition after yet another pro-independence election, if that's the result that people in Scotland choose, the continued opposition to that democratic principle is unsustainable, politically unsustainable, and potentially open to legal challenge as well. So we'll assert that case that Scotland has the right to make its own choice. Did you ever get the million signatures that you promised for another independence referendum? <laughs> I think you're going back to way before the Brexit referendum. The Brexit referendum well, changed everything. Just after 2014. It's not that far ago. We can all remember it. Did you get the million signatures? That was our position before the Brexit referendum. Scotland has been... You've been that now, have you? It's, it's not very convenient. We've certainly changed our position on that because Brexit has changed everything. Brexit is a betrayal of the democratic wishes of Scotland. Scotland's, uh, not only Scotland, but also the, the people in, in Northern Ireland and the people across the island of Ireland have been betrayed. Scotland has been betrayed by Brexit. Uh, it's a deeply harmful uh, position that we now find ourselves in, and it is at odds. It's directly at odds with the promises that were given in 2014, with a Better Together campaign said, the way to protect our position in Europe is to vote no. Well, that wasn't true. It changes the game, and it certainly changes our position uh, on what would uh, justify and require another independence referendum. You talked earlier about wealth taxes and other taxes. How much tax does Scotland need to increase to cover the costs of what you're promising in terms of, well, we haven't seen your manifesto yet, but in terms of what your manifesto will offer? The, the 
really big challenge on tax is not to try and put a figure on it right now. And I don't think any party that does that now would be honest. The, the Finance Committee of the, the Scottish Parliament, just toward the end of the, the last session, said that we need a deep re-examination of our tax base. Not just how much tax to raise, but how to raise it. You want to put it up, but you're not going to say how much. You're not going to tell the voters how much you're going to put up their tax in the next Parliament. We've said that now isn't a, a reasonable time to be raising income tax, uh, except perhaps uh, an, an additional uh, wealth tax for the very highest, uh, you know, the, a millionaire's tax. There's a case for that. There's a case for a pandemic uh, uh, kind of profiteer's tax. Some of the big companies, global companies that have profited massively from the pandemic, a windfall tax on them would be reasonable. Not income tax at the current time, but we also clearly need to reform our local taxation system, which is broken, okay. out of date and deeply unfair. Patrick Harvey, thanks for joining us in Scotland tonight. Thank you.